Welcome to the last episode of the 21st Century Business Forum for 2021. I'm Julio Malara, CEO of the Forum. We're honored that you join us again for this month's episode. Our goal since day one has been to bring you insights, ideas, perspectives, and even inspiration from some of the best business minds and thought leaders in America to help you flourish and succeed in business. While most are in the midst of wrapping up this year, we're ready for 2022. I'm excited to tell you that to kick off the new year in January, future NFL Hall of Famer, business investor, and current NBC analyst Drew Brees will be joining us. We've also lined up some of the most admired CEOs in America, like Steve Bochamp of Pelocity, plus best-selling authors and experts, including the iconic chef and entrepreneur Emeril Lagasse. Bam! We're ready, and I hope you will be too. So we invite you to join us and want to thank you again for tuning in and encourage you to tell your clients, your colleagues, and your friends who want to continue to grow to join us every month. You're in for a real treat today with one of the most extraordinary business leaders and success stories in our country today with the guest, Mr. Junior Bridgman. So I want to wish you all a wonderful holiday season and a happy new year. Stay safe, stay healthy, and remember, the best is yet to come. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 21st Century Business Forum. I'm your host, Clay Young. We are excited to have with us today former NBA great and hugely successful businessman, Mr. Ulysses Jr. Bridgman. Now, despite never making more than $350,000 a season during his NBA career, Mr. Bridgman's net worth grew to over $600 million, making him one of the wealthiest former athletes in the world. His business interests are certainly diversified. After retiring from the NBA, he ultimately became the owner and award-winning CEO of companies operating more than 450 restaurants in 20 states. This includes 263 Wendy's and 123 Chili's locations. These days, he is the new owner of American Icon Magazine's Ebony and Jet after purchasing them out of bankruptcy. He is also the owner and CEO of Heartland Coca-Cola Bottling Company, which owns and operates Coca-Cola production and manufacturing facilities in Kansas and 17 distribution facilities sprinkled across the USA's Heartland. And he's also part owner of Coca-Cola Canada Bottling Limited. So uh, so let's let's begin this morning. Uh, recently, you made some great news. Uh, at a time when print media is seeing all these transitions, you recently purchased the iconic magazines Jet and Ebony out of bankruptcy. And I was telling you a second ago, when I saw that, I was like, oh my gosh, I can't wait to ask him about that because iconic is definitely the word to describe both of those brands. So first, what gave you the motivation to want to do it? And then wh what are you planning to do with them? Well, I grew up, uh, right outside Chicago, uh, right across the Illinois border in Indiana, a little small city, uh, East Chicago, Indiana. But I remember early on going over to Chicago and going, uh, traveling down Lakeshore Drive and looking over to the left and seeing the ebony sign on the building and a big sign on Michigan Avenue uh, in, in a very prominent place. And it, it really gave you a sense of Probably pride is probably the right word to know that, uh, you know, this magazine that uh, your family saw, that you saw, that uh, highlighted really black excellence, you know, was, yeah. was published uh, right uh, about 30, 40 minutes uh, from where I grew up. So that was the beginning, the gist of every, everything as far as my knowing and understanding Ebony and, and, and Jet. And so mm -hmm. when I heard about the difficulties that the magazines had had, uh, we started looking into it and said, uh, you know, if we can acquire this, uh, it would be, well, I, I don't, I don't want to use a lot of superlatives, but it, but it would, it would just say it would be fantastic. And, and why do I say that? Because here's a magazine that's been around for 75 years and, uh, and Ebony that is, and, 
and it highlighted the best, I think, of the African American uh, experience. It highlighted and talked about the worst of the African American experience in this country, and and it was also uplifting. And when you think about 75 years of stories about uh, not, and, and, and I've said Black America, but it's not just Black America, really, it's 75 years of stories about really the history in this country. And, and that was something that we felt uh, a generation probably had missed out on, a generation that needed to understand, needed to learn, uh, needed to know what the past was so that it can help shape the future. <clears throat> and... More importantly, there are so many stories in 75 years that need to be told. I mean, you look at the movie Hidden Figures. That was first written about in Ebony a long time ago. Right. And, in, you know, let's not even get into Jet uh, with some of the covers that it's had. And, and uh, you know, as males, we'll remember the uh, Ebony model of the week. Or See, the- listen, <laughs> listen, listen. I was wondering if you were going to bring it up because I didn't know if I could. But since you, <laughs> so since you drove by there, let's stop just for a little while. <laughs> All right. I, I, I think that that part was I had a conversation with a friend of mine yesterday. And that was the when I told him we were going to be talking at about those purchases. That's the first thing he brought up. And so <laughs> you, I, I used to get the publication uh, at the house. And, and man, again, if, if we'll just leave it there. If you're a male growing up, it was definitely the highlight of your month. Um, well, I've got, I've got to tell you this one quick story. Uh, so I'm out in Los Angeles, and uh, we had just made the acquisition and, and talking to this uh, little gathering. And, 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 you know, people are there with their wives. And one of the wives come up, and she says, I wasn't a jet beauty of the week way back when. And, and I go, well, wow, you know, I think I've only met two or three, but she followed up with, you need to do a then and now thing oh. on the, all the Ebony beauty of the Ebony, all the jet beauties of the week. So, uh, I don't know how that's going to go over with the staff, but uh, it's, it's kind of out there. <laughs> Listen, it's it's amazing. And you said something earlier that I kind of want to go back to, and that is highlighting excellence in the African-American community. Uh, you know, Mr. Bridgman, I believe that for our children, often we have to expose them to excellence and hard work so they see it and they can become it. And so often our young people aren't exposed to what the full capacity of their gifts and talents can be. And when you got that publication, it did highlight businesses. It highlighted things in African-American schools, particularly HBCUs. And it talked about athletes as well. I think that there is a huge gap in our informational society now for the positives in minority communities, both in business and in academia. Could you kind of explain, is that something you plan to do? And if so, tell us a little about that. Well, that's definitely, I agree with you totally. It's, it's something that has, has been missing and we've been highlighting the wrong things. We've been mm-hmm. highlighting for, especially for the younger generation, uh, nothing against you know, the, the, the hip hop lifestyle, it, it's sure. done well by a lot of people. There are a lot of people that, uh, you know, are, are doing great at that, but is that what you want everybody to aspire to be? Same thing with athletics. Is that what you want everybody to aspire to be a professional athlete? You know, nothing wrong with that. I was one, but mm-hmm. there are so many other things, so many other avenues that we need to put in front of people to say, well, if, you know, if you can't, dribble a basketball you can be this you can be that you know it's just a matter of you deciding what you want to be so that's what we want to do and 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 as you said the print you know is is something that has not totally gone by the wayside but in a lot of ways has so all this is going to be done digitally now and uh but it's not just the magazine i mean I, i i highlighted we see uh all the content from 75 years that needs to be told and We've been contacted by all of the, um, you know, the Netflix, the Amazons, the the Hulus, all those people. They want to to look at the content and they want to either make it in the, you know, Netflix series or a movie wow. or whatever it is because there's there's just so many stories about life and things that happen and you know I, I referenced hidden figures that that need to be told so people can see what they can become in a positive way and not just uh, having to you know think about i need to be able to 
carry a football, you know, down a field. Uh, you you referenced sports and and entertainment and in the time since you left the NBA and have gone into business, there is a steady stream of current and former athletes who are making that transition to becoming entrepreneurs. Uh, you but you were really one of the first to parlay it, and we've seen the success. Uh, Shaquille O'Neal, for example, credits what you've done as one of the reasons why he's gotten into franchising. Tell me about that journey, uh, because to become an elite athlete on the NBA level, it takes a commitment and a discipline. But tell me about that journey and and what took you to this space. You know, I had uh, toward the end of my basketball career, uh, there were two things that happened. One, uh, I was involved in collective bargaining uh, for the players, players association. Mm -hmm. And we're at one meeting and, you know, there are four or five players and our attorneys across the table and you've got the owners. And to us, it was the most important thing in the world, you know, collective bargaining, which determines how the whole league's going to operate. But as I looked at the owners, they seemed to be only mildly interested in what was going on. And I, I couldn't understand it because to me at that time, you know, basketball has got to be the most important thing going, period. We took a break and they went to their part of the room and we went to ours. And I kind of eased over to their side to kind of see what they were talking about. And I heard one of the owners talking to the group and now they're all excited. They're all smiling. They're all jubilant. And, uh, He's telling telling one of the group that, hey, I've got this this uh, 500 unit apartment complex going up in Kansas City. It's going to be great. You know, there's room if you guys want to get involved. And one of the other owners, you know, all all excited and, and tone of voice said, hey, you know, I've, I've got this uh, movie that's getting ready to come out. I think it's going to be a big hit. You guys ought to think about coming in on it. And, and he said the name of the movie is going to be The Sting. And uh, yeah. as we know, those of us that are older, that was a big hit. But now right. they were all excited. And yet when the break ended and they had to go back to the table, now they went back to the same old mode. And it, it really dawned on me what they were excited about was business itself and creating something, making something happen. And basketball was just another one of the many businesses that they had, but they were more interested in making something happen. So I said, I need to understand and figure out what it is that's driving them. Spent time with the owner of the Bucks, and that's when I really got interested and, and said, I, I, I'd like to see what I can do business-wise. And that's really how it started. And uh, so I said, and we didn't make the kind of money the guys are making today. So mm -hmm. uh, got involved in the restaurant business thinking uh, that hopefully it'll make some money. So I'll have something coming in while I figure out what I'm going to do with the rest of my life. And then I turn around, it was 30 years later and, and I hadn't really figured out the rest, what I'm going to do with the rest of my life, but we've grown this restaurant uh, business into a, a pretty sizable company and everything just kind of, you know, happened from there. So I, I want to go back because there's so much to unpack in what you just said, uh, because this is an audience of aspiring and current CEOs. And so these kind of opportunities are, are often not available for people to sit in rooms with the most elite of business people to kind of study their mindsets, the, the, the machinations, the way they interact. For you, at, at, just kind of take us back to that day in that room when you realized I should be on the other side of the table that I, I should I, I should be or maybe be in a different space, however you would describe it, kind of take us through what you were thinking. You know, we, I don't think as a player, well, at that time, you ever thought you could really be on the other side of the tape. Okay. You, you didn't, you didn't picture yourself as being an owner. You pictured yourself as, uh, uh, you know, when we, we came in the league hoping to get a job in with some major company when our, our, our playing days were over with, and that, that was kind of the mindset. But what it showed me then was there was more, more to being successful, more to what you could do, because as I thought about the owners and got to learn more about, about them, they, they, were no, they weren't any smarter. They were no different than, mm -hmm. than the players. You know, they, they had just used their, their, their skill. And what was their skill? It basically the same things that we had, which was, hard work and willing mm -hmm. to work hard 
And they had taken that and built that into whatever empire they had business wise. So I said, you know, can, is there a secret? Is there something I'm missing? So I went back and read John Johnson's, you know, autobiography and, and Herman Lewis and Ted Turner, all these people, because I'm thinking there's got to be something I'm missing. Uh, and, you know, the secret, what's the secret? And really it was something you knew all along was in order to be successful, one, you had to be committed to what you were going to do. You had to be willing to put in the hard work and you had to be willing to pick yourself up when things didn't go as you thought and keep going. Just say, well, I learned it not, go, not to go down that road, but I'm going to go down this road now and uh, maybe that'll be successful. So all the things you learn to make you a successful athlete or make you that, that got you to be a CEO or, or on the way, it's no different. It's just you mentally telling yourself, I'm going to be dedicated to make this happen and going out and trying to find a way to do it and accomplish what you want to do, knowing you're going to have everything has setbacks, everything has ups and ups and downs. But I'm not going to let that deter me to get until I get to the goal that I've set for myself. You got out of the NBA in the in the well late '80s, and you transitioned into business. You know, it's I know it's got to be difficult. What were those experiences like in the first few years after going from being an athlete on the court to being a CEO? Two two things I would mention. One. Uh, when you're an athlete, especially fortunate enough to play at that level, uh, the adulation is something that you can't replace. The, mm -hmm. the, the cheers for you, the, as they say, the lights being turned on and, and, and you being uh, someone that everybody looks to, cheers for, all those kind of things. You can't replace that when the game's over. So a lot of players go through, oh, I'd say that, that, withdraw depression uh i'm no longer an nba ball player or, or a professional athlete what am i now so that's a hard adjustment and and what i've seen the bigger star you are the harder it is to get through that that's why you see a lot of guys will still stay involved in in the game because it it fulfills that to some extent that was the first thing you had to overcome the second thing was Everybody in the business world, now they look at you when you sit down with them. Well, you're just an athlete. You don't really understand business. You, you, yeah, you may have a little bit of money, but do you really know, you know, do you really know what you're talking about, what you're trying to do? And you have to prove that all over again to the business world. Uh, best example, I had had a banker that I had banked with most of my playing career and I had, you know, put money in the bank. Well, the minute I went to him after my playing days was over talking about, we're getting involved in this business and everything else. And, and, you know, we need your support. And I went with the guy that was going to be the operations guy for me. And uh, so he listens and all the questions he asked are to the guy that I brought that that's going to be involved with. He doesn't even look at me ask me any questions because it's automatically thinking in his mind, well, he doesn't really know anything about this business. He's still just an athlete. So that you have to overcome. And uh, just knowing that that's how people are going to look at you uh, initially when you get started. Well, you know, that's got to be tough, though. I just want to press in on that, because if you played in the NBA or any pro league, you are in the top percentage of human beings on the planet because of the work that it takes to get there. You have a few thousand pro athletes and billions of people on the planet. So sitting in the room and maintaining your composure, which I think is another talent a CEO has to have, is maintaining personal control, sitting in that room and maintaining control and not standing up being all of being six foot five and say, look, it's my money. Pay attention to me. Talk me through that a little bit. Yeah, that it was, uh, it was difficult, but, uh, there again, it, it wasn't that I felt that I had to last latch out at him. I, I felt I need to prove not just to him, but in some ways to yourself, that I am more than an athlete, that, that I can be successful. 
that I do know what uh, what I'm talking about. And 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 you know, tell you the truth, you know, my you know, I didn't grow up in a family. We didn't talk about you know derivatives and all those kind of things at the <laughs> dinner table. <laughs> you know, we didn't talk about money. Didn't have any. But so. I went back and and spent time with the accountant who I'd paid all this money while I was playing in his, I went to his office and I would spend an hour just asking him questions and questions over and over again. Some about the P&L, you know, starting, you know, I'd heard about a P&L, but you know, how do you really read a P&L? How do you decipher? How does this relate to the business? You know, give me the accounting terms. Let me help me understand. And so you had to, educate and train yourself the same thing you did when you wanted to be better at shooting free throws or making a jump shot or whatever it is you had i had to do all those things myself you know and i always tell people you know malcolm gladwell i think has great book great books and he talks about ten thousand hours being put in in order to be successful at anything uh right and so it was no different i put that ten thousand hours into becoming an athlete now I needed to put that in into becoming something successful in the business world. You know what's interesting about what you said a second ago and 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 just listening to your answer there. And you know, we've read the accolades and things that you've been able to accomplish. You can stop at a 12-year career in the NBA, and that that for a lot of people is a thing you can hang your hat on for the rest of your life. But you've had all this success over 400 uh, restaurants and the Coca-Cola bottling and production. And you said you're still trying to figure it out. And the thing about uh, for your life, the thing about that that is so admirable is if you get so satisfied with where you're standing, you lose the ambitious, the ambition to go where you can go. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. You, you know, you, <laughs> my wife always asked me, when is enough enough? (laughs) And and I always give her that comment by thinking one of the Rockefeller said, uh, Oh, just a little bit more, you know, (laughs) but just a little bit more. It's really not about, about money at this point. It's about helping other people better their lives. And, And that's really what the driving goal is, but you have to have something that gets you excited about getting up every morning. And, uh, you know, uh, for me, it, it really was never about money. If it had been about money in a restaurant business would have been something I had left a long time ago, but you know, we've helped a lot of people and done a lot of things. So it's, it's that thing there that kind of keeps you going, keep, keeps you wanting to present more opportunities for more people to hopefully reach their dreams. So, you know, you've said it was in sports, you wanted to be the best at what you did. Um, and you've applied that to business, wanting to be the best in business. And you've won a number of awards over the years for your leadership. How do you identify a winning formula for business? You know, it, it, it in my mind, it gets to the culture of the company that or the business that you're involved with. The, cu- the culture will determine what level or how successful you're gonna be. Now, what do I mean by that? Uh, you know, what do you, what's most important? And in our business, in any business, I think the customers are always most important, but what's underneath the customers? It's, it's all your team members, your, your employees, your crew people. And then it just kind of comes down from there and, and And what I'm talking about is an inverted pyramid, because when we Mm -hmm. talk to people and say, well, who's at the bottom of the pyramid? I say, I am. I'm the least important person in in this whole structure. I'm just here to support everybody else and try and make what they do a little bit easier. So that's the culture you kind of start with. And then people look to see whether or not you're going to live by that, Mm -hmm. whether or not that's something that's how you're going to act day in and day out. And once you get past all that, and people really realize that uh, he's for real. This is true. Now we can kind of buy in. We can believe in this. We know how this is going to work. And now you've got a company now that can be successful because whatever you're doing, if you're, if you're in sales or you're, you're making something, you're going to have somebody you got to sell it to or, or work with. And how they feel, and by, by they I'm talking about that, your team members or employees, if they feel good about it, then they're, then they're going to trans 
transpose that, translate that to, to your customers, and, and then you start to grow. And that's, a, that's what I call, you know, start of a successful business. Well, let me ask you this kind of piggybacking on that and get your thoughts on the mindset that the greatest leaders create their replacements. Absolutely. Tell, Absolutely. tell me about that. Well, uh, to, not just that, but they surround themselves with people that are smarter than they are. You right. know, and and so from that, you realize that once you once you have all of that in place, uh, you aren't going to be here forever. But you have, you know, in in the soda business and in, in our in our market in our territory, you know, we people say, well, how many how many employees do you have? And I say, well, we have twenty two hundred families because you know we just don't employ the young man or the young lady, but we're responsible most of the time for the kids they have at home or who else they're taking care of. So our responsibility extends to the to the family. And if that's going to continue, and we hope it does generationally, you have to be in, a, in starting with the end or almost the end of mind. And that is who's going to take over, who's going to keep the ship sailing, or else who's going to build it better, stronger than what you have. And so you have to think about all those things. Succession is what we're talking about. But who's going to come in and do all this when your days are coming to an end? Wow. Wow. Um, what three things would you say contributed the most to your success? Uh, you want three, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Give me as many as you want. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'll take, well, I'll take well, eight if you have them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, it, it, I think I was fortunate to, to grow up and have a, a, a mom and a dad, you know, in the household and not that, that, uh, you know, is, is, a key, uh, or I should say not a key, but is, is you have to have that, but I was just fortunate. And, and so, but what that did, it, it, it instilled in me the importance of family. Uh, it also, you know, my dad worked in the steel mills up around Gary, Indiana. And so, uh, you know, we were no stranger to hard work, uh, uh growing up. And so th that is, it, that was the first thing that got started. The second thing was, realizing that uh you you can't accomplish a whole lot just by yourself you have to rely on other people i used to tell people you know i can only make one hamburger at a time personally you have to rely upon a team if you're going to do that so we learned early on you know by playing sports that you're going to be successful if the whole team buys into what you're trying to do and and the last thing i would say is there i've had many people help me along the way uh, you know, I think about the high school coach that, uh, has practicing in the gym. I wasn't, you know, hadn't played a whole lot prior years and, uh, in the summertime practicing and, and we walked out to get water in the hallway. He said, you know, I think you're going to be our dark horse next year. And I didn't even know what that meant. Dark horse, you know, <laughs> at the time, but once I found out just, just a few words spoken at the right time can change the trajectory of someone's life, mine, because it changes what they think about them, of what they think about themselves. And, and him saying that to me gave me the inspiration to keep on working hard because I'm thinking, well, you know, maybe I can contribute. Maybe I can play a lot. Maybe I can hopefully get a scholarship and go on to college. So, but there's been many stories like that uh, along the way, people that I've taken ideas and things from that have really helped uh uh i think shape where you are today it's amazing and i can imagine the early days weren't that easy there had to be some challenges and growing pains along the way kind of talk with us a little bit about mistakes that you learned from and uh have, have you failed at anything in business you know michael jordan's <laughs> always says jordan says there can't be winning without failing they can't or winning without losing and so kind of take me through that Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> I'm laughing because uh, there's probably been more failures or, you know, everybody writes about all of the success. Nobody you know wants to hear about the failures, but those are the ones that you learn from and you learn more about yourself. And uh, I think than you do in anything. What, what do you learn? You learn, uh, you know, obviously what you did wrong. And, you know, we've tried things from, 
you know, getting an oil distribution business and we've opened locations that in the restaurant business that didn't work. And, and, you know, and so you had to close those and, and move on from there. Uh, you know, I could kind of keep going, but, <laughs> but it, it, it's no, you know, for me, I had the advantage of, as, as Michael Jordan said, of, of playing a lot of games, but also losing a lot of games. And, right. And you learn from the losses what you did wrong and what I need to do if we're going to be successful the next time. And it was no different. What I learned from a lot of the losses in the business world was, you know, I had to know as much as I could about another business if we were going to try and get in it. You know, when I got involved in the restaurant, I went and learned everything that I could about the restaurant business. But you think, well, I'll just get another business. I understand you know, business principles. So it should be successful. Maybe, maybe not most of the time it won't be because you don't know when things are not going well until it's too late. So I learned that, uh, you know, and, and relying upon the wrong people to, to make things happen is another big mistake we make. And, and when I would talk to players that want to get the restaurant business, I said, do you want to be in the business? And they say, well, yeah, yeah, but, you know, I got my cousin that uh, really is going to run it. And I said, well, you know, more than likely, you're not going to be successful. And I said, what do you mean by that? I said, same thing. One, you don't you won't know enough about the business if things aren't going well uh, until it's too late. If things aren't going well, you won't know how to change them. And secondly, everybody that I know that has failed has always had their cousin on their third uncle side <laughs> run running for them. <laughs> and it never works out that way so they kind of laugh too but uh uh i said you need to know the business and unless, unless you are ready to be totally dedicated so you're better off just saving your money until the days are when you can't play anymore they won't let you play anymore and then if that's what you want to do go do it at that point <laughs> That's good. Third, third uncle, cousin. I got to. <laughs> so what are some of the business relationships that uh, have been the most important to you over the years? Uh, you know, it, it, uh, I, I, I will say that I have borrowed, taken, uh, stolen <laughs> ideas, uh, things from a wide variety of people. And uh, I'll give you a few examples uh, just in, in treating employees. When I was with the, the Bucks, uh, Jim Fitzgerald, the owner, would, would have a Christmas party. Uh, but it wouldn't be a Christmas party for the players. He'd have a Christmas party for the players' children. And so now when you see a party and the kids and the kids are all getting grip, uh, gifts from Santa Claus, it, it makes you think a little bit different about the company. So mm -hmm. that's just a little idea that we've taken. And when we had, uh, you know, the 400 and some restaurants, every manager that had a child 12 or under got a gift for their kid. And we would have a Christmas party uh, and invite everybody. And, 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 that just made you feel different about the company. And the other thing, uh, example, I, I had the opportunity a number of years ago to go to a little city in Arkansas called Bentonville, Arkansas. And I got a chance to go to this little small company called uh, Walmart mm -hmm. and, uh, and spend time with a gentleman named Sam Walton. Wow. And uh, so, you know, I'm thinking at that time, he, Forbes had him as the second wealthiest person in the world. So I'm thinking it's going to be this great big office and all these things we're going to have to go through. And I was amazed how modest his office was. I was also amazed, how, amazed at how much stuff was in it, junk, <laughs> junk all around. But what I never will forget, and he said, come on, take a walk with me. Let's walk around Walmart. And as we walked around Walmart, he knew everybody by their first name. Wow. And not just knowing them, he knew something about them. And he would tell us stories about all the people that we uh, we encountered as we walked around. And I said, you know what? If I ever get in the position to have a company or a business, I'm going to know something about everybody that works for me. And and I could do that until we got to about 20 stores and we got to 30. I couldn't do it. And it was just <laughs> my brain wasn't big enough. But just the idea 
And I'm, I bring those up, you know, that's just two of many. I could keep right. going and say that a lot of ideas and things <clears throat> I either borrowed, stole, adapted, changed from people that I met along the way. And I'm just fortunate to be able to have had those relationships overall all these past years. Well, listen, I, you know, I don't want to get, take too much more of your time. I've got uh, two more questions. I'll ask them back to back. One, what do you hope your legacy in business will be? And then what's next for you? Uh, two, two good answers, two good questions. And hopefully I can answer. I've, I've been asked that. Uh, what do you hope your legacy is? What do you hope you're remembered by? And, and what would be on the headstone? Uh, and would it even be about business? And, and I would say, and, and I told everybody that when you, when the time's done and you look back over everything, if you can't look back over your life and see where you've helped someone, a group of people, a number of people make their lives better, better their position in life. Uh, if you can't do that, then however many years you've lived, I say, you've just lived in vain. You've, you've missed the mark. Uh, you know, that, that would be, uh, kind of number one. And, and second, uh, you know, I, I think it's about, well, I don't think I know it's about teaching my kids about generational, uh, passing things down from generation to generation, uh, you know, and probably, you know, the, the best example, I, I would have loved to have seen, you know, Ebony and Jed go to, you know, their daughter. I, you know, I know her. I think she's a great person and just continue from there. And, and I've tried to use that as an example to say, you know, as, as black families, we don't really think about generational passing down of things. You know, it's about, you know, because we've never, most of us have never been in that situation. We've never had to think about it. So, I try to get them to not think about themselves or the position they're in, but who's coming after you, which is their kids, and maybe after their kids, and uh, and saying, you know, we've been blessed with a great opportunity that's that's transpired in all of these things. Let's be good stewards of it and make sure that it benefits a number of people, and especially people in the family. So amazing, and the the insight, the man, the 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 level of giving that you have shared with us today. Uh, I think I got time for for one more. What is one piece of advice you think is critical for anyone in business? There will always be more than enough people to tell you what you can't do. There will always be more than enough people to tell you why you can't do it. And there will always be a number of people that tell you why you will fail. And I think you have to listen to all of them, but don't make them the true compass of what you're trying to do and the true compass of your life. Uh, you have to look within yourself and determine is this something I'm really dedicated to doing? I, I want to see happen and I'm going to give it my all in all. But I think too many people have gone by the wayside because they listen to someone say, you know, you can't, that, 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 that won't happen. This is the wrong way. Uh, or, you know, you don't have those skills or whatever it is like that. I was told that mm -hmm. uh, way back when. And if I had listened to it uh, totally, I you know, would not be sitting here talking to you. I think you have to listen to it to say, why are they saying that? Am I missing something? And am I willing to go and adapt and make sure I have whatever it is that, that I may feel I'm missing? And if I believe that, then take the step toward the journey and accomplishing your goal. I think it's wonderful advice. Success is certainly the best revenge. And you've been able to prove that hard work does pay off. Thank you so much. Uh, man, I, I got to tell you, you know, I'm, I enjoy doing these. And I learn as much as I hope the people watching learn from them just by the demeanor and hard work and everything. And I'm super proud of of what you've built and I'm excited about uh, about what's in the future. So hopefully you enjoyed this conversation as much as I did, man. <laughs> I did. You do. You did a great job. You're one of the best, and uh, I hope everybody uh, understands that. 
when they if, when they get a chance to see this. And and what you're doing is not easy either. So it no. takes a skill and a talent to do that. And you ab- absolutely have both of those. So congratulations you, to you. All right. Thank you so much. Listen, keep the success onward and upward, right? Definitely. We'll do it. So remember, <laughs> success is never final. So just keep it going. <laughs> That's it. Thank you, Mr. Bridgman. Thank you. All right. Have okay. a good one. I'd also like to thank you, all of our guests, for joining me this morning and thank our sponsors for making this episode possible. The Business Forum has another exciting lineup for you in 2022, beginning in January with Super Bowl champion, future Hall of Famer, and entrepreneur Drew Brees. That's right. We'll see you next year.